On behalf of the Able Digital Ethics Task Force, I'd like to welcome all of you this afternoon, evening, morning, or mid-morning um, to this fourth webinar organized by ABLE, ePortfolios Australia, and ePortfolio Ireland. And this webinar is run by members of the Digital Ethics Task Force, and we'll get to introductions shortly. Our topic today is artificial intelligence and portfolios. What is on your mind? So please do participate in our poll um, so that we can make this webinar for you, that we are picking topics that you are interested in discussing. And so what we are going to do today is that we have a brief introduction about who we are, who you are seeing here on screen today. Then we are starting us off with a provocation to set the scene. Then there will be a discussion, which will be the topics, the top three topics that you have chosen that you as group would like to discuss. We are getting to a debrief in the end. And then last but not least, we also want to give you an outlook of upcoming events. So now I'd like to hand over to Ellie, who is our first person to introduce herself. Hey everyone, my name is Ali Sanchez. I am the Learning Portfolio Program Manager at Loyola University Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm Christina Hoppner, a Project Lead and Product Manager of Mahara, the open source ePortfolio platform, living in Tifangonui, Atara, Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Megan, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Mize. I am at Old Dominion University, where I'm the Director for ePortfolios and Digital Initiatives. And hello, I'm Teresa Conifery. I'm at Santa Clara University, where I teach in the engineering program and in the English department. Thank you so much. And so as you will have seen, we are on two sides of the Pacific Ocean and then also all, um, pretty much on the Atlantic Ocean as well with Megan at Old Dominion. So we cover a large area, not the entire world with facilitators today, mm -hmm. but um, we certainly have a good program hopefully in store for you. So um, while Megan is um, continuing, Ellie will actually tally up all the votes for the AI topic. So if you haven't voted yet on which topic you'd like to hear, please do so in the next 30 seconds before the uh, poll is closed so that we can then decide on the continuation of the, the program. But over to you now, Megan. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. And we would like to give a general provocation for the entire session because we recognize that there's a lot of conversation and anxiety and excitement around AI and generative AI in particular. But as ePortfolio practitioners, we wanted to pose a large overarching question for today and future conversations. Uh, and if you would advance that slide. And our question is this. How does integrating generative AI into ePortfolio practice affect the learner's experience of authorship, <laughs> composition, design, and metacognition? Uh, and so we'd like to invite you uh, to respond in the chat, you know, think about it for a few moments and then free write some responses of what you think um, your answers to that question might be, recognizing we've asked you a few different factors. And you all didn't realize this was a working session for you, did you? But um, but it helps us to know what the community is thinking before we start talking about it. Mm. Very excited to see these comments in the in the chat. Please keep them coming as people add them. Um, would any of our early respondents care to elaborate on their comments? Um, Brian, I loved yours about a sandbox environment but I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. You can put me on the spot a little bit. It's um, uh, <laughs> it maybe self-explanatory. Um, it's um, um, e-portfolios, uh, you know, where I guess we're uh, falling into kind of a presentation mode when we're talking about portfolios, but they can also be on the other end of the uh, workflow. 
uh, be a place mm -hmm. to start working. And I started thinking ideas and pre pre sharing and pre submitting and pre drafting. Mm -hmm. ideas. So that's all I had in mind. So being a writing teacher, I had that all in mind, maybe. As an English scholar who teaches writing herself, I'm thrilled that you're here and you said that. And I think that ties very nicely to Tim's comment about a dynamic partner. So Tim, would you mind if we link your comment there and maybe say a bit more, uh, remembering that we're also sharing with the recording? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I mean my idea was more as you're uh, collecting your mementos, revealing stories, your artifacts, they start to create a network of understanding and then you forget those ideas and then this AI can then bring them back to the surface and make it so that it informs your current practice and gives you that hindsight that you mm -hmm. didn't realize that, oh yeah, I already had that idea two years ago. So mm -hmm. to my mind, it makes the portfolio even more valuable because it's shifting away from grades to actually artifacts that help me enhance my understanding of my practice. I love that example uh, that you just gave too, because I had a graduate student who was putting in materials that she'd had over time looking for trends. And she realized that she continually returned to um, this concept of, of labor. And she didn't realize that that was actually something that really interested her for, for four years. And yet, even in very separate papers, she would ping the same kind of concept. So she started realizing she was creating a niche for herself, even if she hadn't realized that, realized that across her curriculum. Uh, so excellent. And uh, Martha, I see your comment here. So do you mind if I call you out and ask you to say a little bit more about you're not sure yet? Well, my university just rolled out its own Gen AI tools last August. And the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor did that because um, the material that's put into the Gen AI won't learn off of that material. It'll still belong to the students, the faculty, or the staff who puts it in there. So there's lots of more privacy and all those things. And so I've made sure that the students know that they can use all those tools and it's totally acceptable in the class, but we haven't had a chance to use it beyond that. And next fall, I'll be working with a different professor than the one that as a staff member I've worked with in the past. And that person seems really resistant. She doesn't wanna have even a computer open in their dialogue classes. And so I'm just glad here to see all the other things about iteration and all those other things, because if she knows better, maybe we can get her to come around. <laughs> And I think that's a great point. Um, you know, I saw folks saying I'm still evaluating large language models. I'm not sure yet. And, and I think that's probably a great space for this conversation today. That's why we we titled it what we did. You know, what are on people's minds? We don't want to make assumptions. In fact, in your comments here, I see a lot of positive spins on the integration of AI. I see hesitancy. Um, you know, all of that's the right space for us. So I'm, I'm really grateful um, that you guys are on that spectrum. And I'd like to close with one more. So yes, thank you everyone who mentioned iteration, feedback, reflection, metacognition, all of those things that it would be very difficult to give away to AI, um, but maybe AI can help amplify that. I'd actually like to close this provocation section uh, with, is it Kenji, is that how you say that? Uh, and maybe say a little bit more about how you think AI could help with feedback uh, when it may not be easily available to them, because that's a really lovely comment, I think here. I, I think for us, um in the UK, and I, I work specifically within the college sector, where students struggle with self-directed learning. We see the AI potentially as offering the feedback and the scaffolding that we just don't have the resources to offer them. And for them to be offered assistance at the point of, of the problem or the challenge that they face, where they are waiting for the next day or the next couple of days where they can actually speak with a lecturer, just doesn't work. They just need that assistance at the point where they struggle. Absolutely. We're having a lot of conversations at our institution about just in time support, increasing high touch, uh, high response feedback, and certainly tools like this may be one way to help amplify and help with issues of labor and scale. So um, to your point about timeliness, I think that's really key, especially as we go uh, we see education increasingly globalized, right? So 
I want to thank all of you. I know that we threw a couple of requests to you uh, just now, and please feel free to continue chatting uh, throughout this. This really is a conversational session. Um, and Christina and Ali, are we ready? Do we have our, yes, I take that as a yes. Thank you, everybody. I just need to refresh things so that we are good to go. So now we have, or oh, Ellie, not we, Ellie has tallied the votes on what topics um, the majority of you were interested in looking into now for the remainder of the session. And so Ellie, do you want to highlight who the first uh, top three picks were, please? Yes, number one was emerging trends in AI use in e-portfolio e practice. Um, the second topic is guiding students as they encounter AI tools. And the third is ethical considerations of AI in e-portfolios. Okay, and so through the magic of updating slides, we will only show you these slides. But um, as you can see from the link that you have in the chat for the slides, um, that all of them will be in there for the other topics as well. So if you do want to go back to them at a later stage, then you're very welcome to do so. But now I'm handing back to Megan to start us off with this topic and um, I can help out at other times when, when you want. Hello, everyone. You may recall me from such events as your earlier conversation. Um, so I'm so thrilled you picked this one because it makes sense for this conversation. Um, again, we've seen folks talking about uh, artificial intelligence and the intersection of writing. So uh, shout out to my fellow writing instructors in the room. Um, and we've seen a lot of hand wringing, a lot of anxiety, and I'm not saying any of that is misplaced. Um, but anytime we have a new media or an emerging media, we're really looking at new literacies. And the thing is that uh, e-portfolios are not missed by this in any way. And in fact, due to their very digitally born nature, um, they've been intersecting with AI for quite some time. Uh, we just maybe weren't paying quite as close attention or articulating it. Um, because it wasn't challenging some of our more foundational concepts, such as, and I think, uh, was it Michael earlier who wrote, writing is no longer unique. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I heard a few pearls get clutched there. But, uh, <laughs> but all of that to say is when we look at portfolio platforms, we're seeing a number of things come through. First, we're seeing tools, AI tools that help with text improvement. This is old hat to many of us by this point uh, with things like spell check and Grammarly um, and things of that nature to help students with syntax and uh, mechanics. Uh, but we're also seeing a rise in accessibility AI. So uh, things like uh, accessibility wizards and checkers that can run through the entire site and make sure that students are meeting uh, web accessibility standards and help point out how they might um, fix them. Uh, we're also seeing a rise in color palette and color design AI tools. So uh, anytime I ping Adobe Color, there's always someone in the room who, who has comments about using it or, or not, but Adobe has done a lot of work to help people pick and test uh, accessible color palettes and design um, complex color palettes using really sophisticated color theory for folks who are not um, graphic or web designers. Um, we're also seeing help with layout support. Uh, and in fact, I was just on a call the other week talking to people who had a lot of anxiety about these websites that can generate entire uh, AI, AI tools that can uh, generate entire websites uh, and build in the layout. Um, although again, that would put into place things like header one, header two, and body font tags. Um, so it's an, an accessibility move. And then of course, we're seeing a rise in generative AI and AI uh, editors, um, certainly things like Canva, which are incredibly popular with students and faculty alike. Uh, helping build out um, entire videos just from a few keywords or edit down um, course lectures uh, or presentations to, to much shorter bits. 
And then, of course, the one that has um, just disrupted and disturbed uh, many folks is content generation. Um, and I think we're going to show this slide with Riff later, is that right? Uh, but we're showing, uh, but we're seeing, of course, a rise in platforms integrating generative AI for text and image uh, images. So I'll just give the popular example of Wix, which now has um, generative AI text uh, options in in the actual web builder. So they don't even have to go outside of the web builder. They can just open a text box and the um, the bot will start to help them. Um, so yes, and where Michael says, we're really talking about a rise of multimodal presentation and assessment. I hope so, because that is certainly the world of communication uh, that our students are in and are expected to, um, <laughs> um, to know how to navigate. I just saw in the chat, someone appreciated my Troy McClure reference. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here for you. And yes, WordPress is increasing that. We're seeing this across multiple web building platforms. And just as a uh, an early alert, we are hosting a um, roundtable with three platform providers in April who are talking about how they are integrating AI into their web building platforms. Um, Christina, I've said a lot. Would you like to pick it up from here? Thank you, Megan, to kick us off with this topic. And since we have um, six ideas of where artificial intelligence can be used in portfolio practice. I'd just like to know in the chat if you could say which ones you've probably encountered yourself already or which ones you're most intrigued about. And we certainly will be looking at um, an AI chatbot with you shortly. What I really like about um, this the summary of emerging trends in AI use that Megan has given us um, is that it does not just focus on the content generation, which of course since November 2022 has been in has has been the the major focus, but that there are so many other areas um, where artificial intelligence can be can be used, and therefore. Um, it's not just one area, but many different ones. And in particular, the accessibility and color design areas are fascinating. And I can also imagine that media editing would be a good topic to look into more um, for those of us that might be a bit more challenged in creating um, amazing visuals uh, for uh, decoration purposes or also for inclusion in the um in the portfolio. So what we thought we, we do with you now, emerging trends in AI yields, um, that we do look a bit at content generation, but with a twist really. If you've been in the last webinar that we ran with uh, Leticia Pretas Cavagnaro from uh, the AD School at Stanford University, um, there you would have encountered Riff which is an, um, an AI chatbot. And the wonderful thing about that one is it asks students questions and helps them in their reflection rather than actually writing text for them. And so what we wanted to do now with you is um, a small activity where you can explore Riff on your own um, the link is in the chat, and I'm just going to the the slides to to pull that one up. So if you were on your mobile phone, you would be able to just use the QR code. And so that's that's a different type of AI that really integrates well in my views with portfolio practice because it helps with the reflection. So click the link in the day, in the chat, please. Uh, that takes you to Riff, and you will be presented with a screen that um, just let me open that for you and go there. That loads a chat box window where you are not asking for your name, and um, so you can stay anonymous. And you have an initial question. How have you used AI in your teaching and or learning? Reflect on your experience so far 
and provide some details from a memorable, memorable experience or event. And take about um, three minutes to type a response, send, and then see what Triff gives you back. So don't try to type everything immediately into that chat box, but see that you can engage with it a bit and see what happens there for you. I think we are ready to move on here. And so we, before we get to your opinion on Riff and how, what, how you like the experience, I do want to briefly show you the magic behind it because really all that a learner sees when they get to the chatbot is that initial question prompt. And so in contrast to other chatbots that could also be used to configure to work with a reflective framework, um, all of that is built directly into Riff already. So that is where the work that Leticia has been doing um, shines through because she is a researcher in reflection and therefore provides that scientific background and that uh, modeling and the framework behind the, the application so that a teacher, all that they would need to do is um, say whether a name should be asked um, so you can use it in the classroom as well if you want to use it with names. Then there is an intro text that can be defined. Um, and then you have the opening question. So that is the one that um, you saw. Now, what I can also do is set some more context so that the artificial intelligence at the end um, can tailor the responses, the follow-on questions more to that context. So are we talking with um, younger students? Are we talking with older students and the like? And so to contextualize that a bit better. And so what I can now see in the activity log, because I set up the spot, is that we have people who have responded. I can see how many times they have um, used the bot um, to, to respond how many words they have written. And you should have also had the opportunity after I think at least three prompts, uh, three follow-on questions that you can um, have a summary sent to you of the conversation that you have had with Riff. So there was one that um, had six turns altogether. And so I would now like to hand it over to you and just hear from you how you liked that experience. Um, was there anything that was revealed to you? Um, did you have a good reflection experience? Um, what are your first thoughts on it? Alison, do you maybe mind um, talking about what you had written in the sure. chat? Not sure. It it, do you, you want to does it can you see it is that what i'm i forgot what it looks like on the other end um but who were you here um, i asked the uh first question i asked was i used ai to design assignment descriptions uh let me see if i can search for it because i'm okay there it is that's me uh 219 i didn't I get that AI, right yeah please please okay. feel free it's not great and i'm very happy to be a guinea pig <laughs> so thank you um, Alison. yes of course what i liked about this um you know number one we're all it's the end of the day everyone's just kind of like where we're at and i was just thinking i enjoy using riff but one of the things i struggle with as an educator is making sure that the outcomes that I want to see are clarified within the design of the assignment for the students. I sometimes skip that step in my design of, you know, what do they, what are they producing versus what are they learning and how are they making those connections? And this is just kind of where I, I, I started to work on that of I'm using this to shorten my descriptions, but to make sure they're a little bit more clarified. And what I liked about Riff is it said, well, how does, how does that relate to the outcomes? And I'm thinking, I don't know. I'm tired. And so I just was honest and said, I don't know. And then Riff is like, well, here's a starting point. And I think Megan, you responded in the chat that that's really what our students do too. And it just, I like that reader, um, the iterative process of 
saying it in a different way because when students come to us and go can you say it in a different way so often we maybe don't because we've been so trained and so ingrained in our discipline and our work so for what it's worth um that was a great exercise i appreciate that thank you thank you Alison. um in the chat i saw a comment pass by that uh let me find it again that said um that Initially, it was fine. Um, I'm just paraphrasing here because uh, there, there's so many comments from you in there. Um, but that it then turned into leading questions. Um, the person who said that, do you want to ex um, go into a bit more detail of that? Or anybody else um, who'd like to share on audio, or I can also look back at the chat log and read a few more comments. I, I think that was me, I wasn't sure, but um, initially yes. I think I asked two things at once. And so then it was just repeating back the two things slightly differently, which was okay for the first two rounds. But then mm -hmm. by the third round, it just repeated it back again because it couldn't go anywhere. I had to take it somewhere else and I wasn't necessarily thinking that way. I was hoping for a conversation where it would lead me. Mm -hmm. So how, um, Tim, Megan asked the question, how did it feel to have it do that in that reflective so, moment? Well, initially I felt like I was going somewhere, but then I realized that it didn't know anything else than what I was offering it in the sense of the way I was asking the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so it was Brian who said, like a lot of AI, the prompts are open at first. Um, and now I lost it again. But then um, they were leading questions. Teresa, you, you said you had used it in your own classes. Um, what are your experiences so far in it? Yeah, I've let uh, students choose whether they want to respond to an open end prompt or use Riff. Um, some like it more than others. I put in the comment about not knowing how to finish it because initially when I used it, um, I hadn't thought about that either. Um, so you can give them a time limit or ask them to write by as a way to end it. And students, they can get a summary of what they've said, uh, what the AI takes from the conversation, which they find interesting. I like that I get a summary of the main concerns of the students. Um, and I've had students do both prompts, do a traditional reflection um, on an essay or a stage or a part of a writing assignment, and then do the riff prompts and compare and contrast them. But generally, they appreciate that it asks them questions that they wouldn't have thought about and can maybe give them a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I put this in the chat, but I have a a capstone course for cybersecurity students, which is an ePortfolio course. And uh, at Old Dominion, we have a high level of first generation and Pell Grant students. And um, in, in my course evals, one of my students, uh, and this is a, a direct quote, she said, I never know what my professor means by reflect. I did the assignment. What more do you want? And when um, I had them start playing with Riff, it's just a, a low stakes, three to five minute um, and then I had them analyze what kinds of questions is Riff asking you um, that maybe you hadn't thought of before. And then they started identifying. So to Tim's point about repetition, I think Leticia would say that's actually built in um, because it's trying to build out a habit to now it may short circuit and not go where you need it to. But I thought that was really interesting because for a lot of us, you know, we're, we're within context where we're asked to reflect all the time. We know why we're reflecting and we know how to move beyond that superficial. I learned a lot, but a portfolio is a deep dive on reflection. So if you don't even understand the concept of reflection, you're definitely going to, to struggle with the concept of why you're doing a portfolio. It, it just becomes a folder uh, with things stuffed in it um, rather than something with a reflective narrative. So I, I definitely, um, and I will say, as much as I love my cybersecurity students, they're not necessarily trained in very um, humanities-driven reflection. So they they at first thought that was extremely fluffy until we tied it to things like after-action reports. So um, this AI was helpful. And to someone's earlier point, um, 
I have students who are in Korea or who are deployed and I can't be around to help them at 3 a.m. But they were able to to come over to Riffbot and, and, and feel like they were talking to someone who was somewhat like an instructor and, and figure out what did I mean by reflect. So. Thanks, Megan. And uh, yes, so the, the underlying reflective framework that uh, is currently used in RIF is what, so what, now what from Burton. And that's what you will also notice in the questions that are being asked. What I find fascinating about this tool really is that it is very easy to get started. Um, therefore, not all any one of us needs to become a prompt engineer and try to fine tune it, but that all of that is already done and can be that guide, uh, not the guide on the side, but um, that reflective partner for when there is nobody else there to reflect with. And there might be some questions coming up that had not been asked before. My question is, when we are looking at digital ethics now in regards to using a chatbot to elicit these reflections is um, how, how open is somebody going to be in the reflection? Where does the data go? Who can see it then later on? As you will see here, when, when I'm logged in as teacher, it is very clear that I have access to that data that I can view it, that Riff can also generate that overall summary for me. And uh, that, that is really important for Leticia as well. In, and she, she wrote a wonderful blog post on that because it uh, can then be taken back into the classroom without mentioning names of who had written what, but can inform further teaching and learning. And also, once you have written by into the chatbot when you want to finish the conversation, there is the offer of um, getting a summary sent to you. At the moment, uh, the conversation itself is not sent, but only a summary. And that, of course, is generated then by the AI. So I think it is um, worthwhile exploring more and seeing whether it does have a place in portfolio practice and where that place could be in order to find out whether that is an AI use that um, an organization wants to take or that an instructor wants to try out in their own classroom. And Megan posted the link to the blog post in the chat so that you can follow up with it. Um, currently, Riff is in a close beta, so you can definitely put your name onto the wish list and you will get access to it. And Leticia also started running Reflective Friday sessions, um, meaning that um, those that are using Riff can come together, learn from each other of um, what has been working well for them, and also very much influence the um, yeah, giving feedback, which can then influence the product development further in order to see where it can be taken, what uh, is useful at the moment for educators. It is very much built with the higher education context in mind, but can also be used very well with individuals. And I'm sounding like a sales pitch. Um, it is not. I'm not being sponsored by anybody um, involved with the app. I just really like to show it as an example that is different from the normal chatbot activity that we are seeing uh, where the chatbot gives the answer. Because, of course, we are in the portfolio space and looking at how can we support the reflection of students. And so that is one tool that can be explored for that. Now, we will take a look at a different topic, though, our second topic, and that is the one of guiding students as they encounter AI tools. At the end of the session, before we just continue, just briefly to let you know, we will have a coming together, reviewing what has been talked about in the session today um, so that you can clarify yourself where you might want to go. So you will have the chance to come back to these things. Then over to you, Teresa and Ellie. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I just put in the comment too, um, just finishing off what Christina was saying about Riff, that if you are using it, if you want to try it, 
I found that um, Letitia gets back almost immediately any questions that you might have. So uh, that's good to know. She is very much um, hands on. So yeah, on our slide up there, we have different ways or different aspects of using AI that students might need help with. And I'm just gonna jump around, feel free to put in the comments, in the chat, um, anything, any aspect that you might like us to go into more depth about. The first point, hallucinations. I'm guessing everybody is familiar with that, that the students need to verify any content depending on what kind of e-portfolios you have, um, maybe that's not such an issue, but if students are doing other kinds of writing, anything that involves citation, factual content and so on, we need to make our students aware that they can get very convincing sounding information that is incorrect. Um, and then in terms of using AI in general, I guess my main point is that there's been I guess what some people would call a paradigm shift in writing, that instead of thinking of writing as a product, thinking of it as a process. So another issue with AI that we as teachers might encounter when regarding our students is this fear that they might cheat. And um, if we ask ourselves, well, why would they cheat? Often it's because they think that there is one right answer or that there's one right way, one good way to do the essay. But if we are talking about our assignments, if we are sort of clarifying to students that it's not about the right answer, it's about the process, it's about how you get there, that will also, um, I find, be very helpful in their use of, of a different AI tools. So kind of connected with that then, thinking about the process, that would lead me as well to... to prompt to change my essay prompts, to change how I use ePortfolios, to make it very clear, very explicit that it is about the process, that I am scaffolding the writing, that I'm not asking for a final product, that maybe there will be the ePortfolio and process, there'll be lots of opportunities for um, revision, that uh, I will be encouraging them to use AI tools and to see what's gained from them. For example, if they were writing in about me, they could write their own version and they could input that into their favorite AI tool and see how it could be improved, quote unquote, and um, look, compare and contrast. What was their original version? What is the AI version? What do they want to take from that? How does it change? How does this, does it distort what they intended? So I guess there are lots of issues um, as we use AI tools with our students, I work with students from freshmen to um, to master students, and the freshmen, I, I would say, are preoccupied with this correct answer. Even writing a reflection, um, are they giving me what I want? They think I want to hear in the reflection. So by focusing um, on the process and focusing, for example, talking about um, what kind of writing is produced by AI. How does it sound? Does it sound what they might consider more professional? Does it sound more academic? And then asking themselves, is that how they want themselves to be portrayed? Who is it that they are writing the um, or creating the ePortfolio for? How are they using it? Is it a tool to display their learning? In which case, it's not going to be helpful to have writing produced by um, AI tools. But if they are using it to for more metacognitive processes, for um, self-regulation, then these questions of of how they could use writing, uh, they could use AI tools in the writing process, that is going to be more upfront rather than just producing something um, that is that looks good that they think reflects or not reflects, but is what they assume their their instructor is looking for. Um, and then uh, some of these other topics here, uh, I guess my, my colleagues will have already spoken to them a little bit um, and we'll probably come back to them later. Raising awareness of bias, data privacy, what kind of text is being produced apart from maybe saying that it's academic or that it is professional. What kind of voice is it in? Is it kind of white academic, does it represent other voices? If they choose to use the voice of the AI, 
what is being gained and what is being lost. So asking them to um, consider issues such as this. And I'm gonna take a break and turn it over to Ali to fill in her main concerns. Yeah, I was, as you were talking, I just wanted to build a little bit on the idea of <clears throat> how so many people are worried that students will use AI for cheating or taking shortcuts or things like that. But as we're learning more about AI, we're learning how hard it is to detect. And so um, maybe the goal really should be to shift away from trying to detect it to um, reworking our assignments and reframing um, things so that we aren't just constantly spending all our energy um, trying to figure out if students are using AI. Um, and so I, I have one colleague that has done such a good job of um, really focusing on process over product in her um, e-portfolio practice. Um, and so just as an example, and I'd love to hear from other people how they've seen this work, but um, in her portfolios, she will ask students a question. And then along with the answer, she asks her students for at least three pieces of evidence. And so the evidence can come from their notes. It can come from something that was discussed in class, um, from a textbook. It could be anything that just shows that they were actually engaging with the content that got them the answer. Um, and then she provides them some sort of feedback within their portfolio and then asks them again to reflect on the whole process. So there's a lot of ways she's really checking in with them to really see that they engaged in some way. And sure, maybe they got some answers from AI, but that could be a piece of one of their evidence pieces. Like, well, I typed it in here and this is what happened. And um, so it's, she just encourages a lot of evidence um, and engaging with the materials. So I'm curious to hear from others. What have what have you seen? What's worked? Yeah, Megan. Um, Megan. <laughs> yeah. Hi guys, I uh, apologize. I, I'm thinking a lot about this these days. Uh, so at Old Dominion University, we actually have an e-portfolio studio that runs very similar to a writing center. It's a multi-literacies lab. Uh, and we have peer mentors within there that are called e-portfolio assistants. And we've been working uh, really hard this last year and a half thinking about how are we helping those who are kind of in the murky middle of institutional policies, these students who are peers, but are also voices for the institution. Um, and we're, we're developing training for tutors in the Writing Center, the Math and Science and Resource Center, the ePortfolio Studio, to help them identify where students are using AI in relation to their you know, their chosen tutoring path. So for us, it's it's web design um, and, and reflective writing and multimodality um, and how they're seeing students use AI, what are the ethical concerns. And it's tough because these students don't actually have power or agency to dictate anything to the institution and they have a lot of social risk. So when we talk about guiding students, one takeaway I hope for this workshop is that I hope you'll go back to your institution and advocate that tutoring and other student support staff are included and trained as your, your institution makes its policies because they get left behind in these conversations. And yet they're a lot of times in the trenches um, doing the work with those students daily. Um, and so we've had a lot of really good conversations and we are trying really hard to thinking about labor as uh, as we see institutions, and I'm not going to call a, a major one in Arizona out, but uh, racing to purchase tutor bots and replace the human um, mentorship. Um, so what does that mean? If you buy a bot and you get rid of the peer mentor? Yeah, I see Tim shaking his head. I, I'm sure he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, which is why we showed something like Riff, where it's a co-pilot rather than a replacement. But uh, when we guide students, I think I think we need to have explicit conversations, not just in the classroom, uh, but also with this, the support uh, mechanisms that are amplifying the classroom learning experience, because they, they're they really left out of that conversation. And there's a good yeah. comment by, by Mark in the chat. Um, are the administrators and faculty cheating by using AI? We are usually talking about cheating by students, but what about the other side? That um, that question has come up more lately, and so I'd be interested to know what you're thinking about it. Yeah, I can see there was a comment. Um, I think it was from Alison. Um, is AI cheating for students? 
I'll find it now. Uh, is it a tool for us, but bad for students? Um, I think we need to address that as well. And that's our second point, learning with AI as a tutor, not a ghostwriter, which goes back to um, what Megan has said about having the tutors who are working with students on ePortfolios with AI tools that, that, um, that we're all see, sort of seeing it as a collaborative learning enterprise or um, learning practice. And for students too, being explicit in the classroom, how we use it, um, letting them practice using it, but making the point that we don't want them, that there's not any value with uh, um, bots that would do the writing for them, sort of getting them to see that what is lost and what's gained, that there are certain skills that we want them to acquire. And by skipping or um, avoiding those skills, how are they shortchanging themselves? But as with reflection, that's not always obvious to students. What's obvious to us can be quite new and quite puzzling to them. So again, I want to put in a plug for being as explicit as possible. Being um, being open that we are all learning how to use AI tools together and we're encouraging them to, to practice using them, but to be reflective, to ask themselves um, how they're using it, what they're gaining and what they're losing from using it, I think is very important. Robert, I made, made a good point in the chat. AI is a tool for instructors and students. It is up to instructors to help students learn ethical practices for using AI. And I think that goes back also to what Megan had said. We do need the institutional support for that because we can't expect that all of you immediately are AI experts, have read all the 27 pages of um, disclosures, terms and conditions, privacy statements of not just one tool, but many that might be in use. If you remember the different uh, ways of um, where AI can be used, um, that is not just about generative AI, but also all the other things. So yeah, there's a lot of learning that is happening and needs to happen for which I believe the having institutional guidelines will help lecturers will help learning designers because of course here with the digital ethics task force we are advocating for transparency and also awareness and support for those that are engaging in portfolio practice because we can't just put it all on the students or on the individual faculty. Mm -hmm. um, adding to that I think it is also helpful to have an AI policy as instructors or this is what I've done in my classes I've come up with a draft of the A policy that I'm using in my classroom and then having students look at it discuss it and modify it but all but also reminding students that that's my policy and as it's new different instructors are going to have different policies um, and that they do need to to check in to check in with each uh, each instructor, what their ways of using it are, what they consider appropriate and um, and cheating or uh, inappropriate use of it. Megan. Yeah, I put this in the chat, but again, for the recording, we had a really unique instance at ODU, hopefully it's unique, in which a student's writing improved over time, which first of all, I would ask you all, isn't that really the point of uh, higher ed <laughs> is to help students improve over time? But the instructor thought there's no way that she's uh, improved in six to seven weeks. So clearly she's using AI. And it turned out the student was very dedicatedly going to the writing center and they had the receipts and they had the different drafts. And I think there is this strange kind of murky, middle, ambiguous. I know we're asking ethical questions in the chat and we're going to get to it. But, you know, one of the things I posed back to our vice provost of academic affairs was isn't the writing center in some ways also a support mechanism in the same way that AI potentially would have been. So where is your clean division of good help, bad help? Um, and nor did that student ever deserve to be punished for seeking the help we offer. So just, uh, you know, I don't have a clean answer to that, but just something that happened that I thought was noteworthy in, in this, this panic over tools that now we're pointing fingers at students who are actually learning. <laughs> And maybe for the last minute or two, we've already touched on this, but um, the final point there on the slide, being curious, asking effective questions, considering audience. That's for us as much as it is for the students. Um, Christina mentioned prompt engineering, but having students experiment with different questions, getting more specific in their questions, all of that is very useful 
they're again um, helping students understand the advantages and the limitations of using some of these tools. Ryan, I think your comment around uh, copyright in the chat will be a separate topic uh, because that that is a very contested one, and and yeah, very big conversations are happening, will be happening. We just need to look at the the case that the New York Times has brought forward, um, where it just goes quite far into the copyright area there. And of course, also the the screenwriter strike. So it will definitely still be a big space to watch what is happening and um, how it can be ensured that not just the copy uh, that copyright is respected, but any of the rights that authors give. Because of course, um, those of us that are publishing with a Creative Commons license, um, yes, we make content freely available. But on the other hand, if that content then is not cited and um, the source is given properly, then there is also still a violation in that. And so there will need to be lots more conversations around this topic. And so if that is of interest at some point, um, then we can certainly see how we can facilitate that here from ABLE ePortfolios Australia and ePortfolio Ireland from the conversations. But let's move on to our third topic now, which is ethical considerations of AI use. We've already talked about this a bit uh, right now. The, the topic of copyright had come up in the chat, there was also a discussion around what are AI hallucinations, um, what is happening there, what is happening with the student data, if we are using a tool, is it safe for students to use? Um, if tools, for example, are um, housed in the United States, what about people in Australia, people in New Zealand, people in the European Union and in other countries. Um, what is happening in that um, at that point? Um, are their rights uh, being respected or does something else need to be done? And so we'd like to do a, again, a small practical activity for you or with you, actually, not for you, with you, um, where we look at a, an an AI policy, an uh, open AI's privacy policy. But don't worry, you don't have to read the whole thing. If you, if you have not yet read it, you do not need to log in for that. Um, we, we pulled out, uh, if you can search on the page for one of those three areas, how we use personal information or information uh, aggregated or de-identified information and a note about accuracy. If you want to just look at um, maybe one or two of these different sections and read closely and see how you're interpreting these things um, and then come back to the chat of what stands out for you in there. Do you have any concerns or is anything unclear? So the link to the policy is in the chat. I'm just putting it into the chat though again, just in case. And thanks Megan for doing it as well. Um, and we'll come back in about five minutes again to give you time, because of course, since it's a policy, even though the sections are fairly short, we do want to give you time to digest it, to think about it, and um, see how that maybe also stands up to one of your existing guidelines or policies that you already have. So Michael's already pointing out he's been using the how we use personal data section that to improve our services and conduct research, any personal information that can be stored and used. So that of course leaves things wide open um, and doesn't really say much. Ah, good question, Michael. There is actually a separate version for um, for those people that live in the European Union. So that was a part that I did not show you in the beginning um, or at the start. That's that first sentence here. Um, though having briefly compared the two versions, 
they don't really differ too much. There's a bit more in there in regards to the right to be forgotten and the sections are named differently, but overall it is uh, very much similar. Um, and it's just that, yeah, generative AI needs data. In the chat, there was also the the question about um, plagiarism checkers, how um, what how they fit into the picture. And there, of course, it is that all the data that has been submitted to them has often been used for training algorithms, for training um, the mathy math in order to come up with the services that are now being provided. And thank you, Megan, for explaining what the GDPR is. It is the General Data Protection Regulation in the European Union and similar regulations are also coming or uh, have already been implemented in other countries and jurisdictions. And that basically means that personal information is uh, needs to be treasured, needs to be held responsibly, and organizations that store that information need to follow certain rules, in particular also being able to delete that data and um, not find it again uh, and, and remove it from, from the corpus. Though, having said that, what I find interesting then is that paragraph right below about aggregated or de-identified information, because in here it is said that they might aggregate or de-identify personal information so that it can no longer be used to identify people. But then if I want to be forgotten, my information is still in there. It is not tied to my person. Or if something that I've said is kept in the training data, but my name is not associated with it, how can it then be referenced properly? So there are also some of those questions that come up for me. But what are your questions in regards to what you have read in this privacy policy? Do you have any understanding questions or um, how, how that might influence whether you'd want to use that service with your students? And of course, we have to say none of us here on the call are lawyers, so we are not giving legal advice or advice on what you should or should not do in, in regards to using any of these tools. While we're waiting for some comments, the best thing that I find in here, it is that almost in fine print, because it's not even a heading, so it can easily be overlooked, is that note about accuracy. I don't remember having that seen in an earlier version of the uh, privacy policy, but here it pretty much goes to, to talk about what is commonly referred to as hallucinations, that they are inaccuracies. So that services like ChatGPT generate responses by reading a user's request and in response, predicting the words most likely to appear next. That's pretty much all that generative AI does. It looks at a huge data set, figures out what is typically said. And so once you have one word, it predicts the next word, the next and the next. And that's how it makes up its answers. So it is just uh, statistics and predictions, but not actual knowledge. Then the policy continues. In some cases, the words most likely to appear next may not be the most factually accurate. For this reason, you should not rely on the factual accuracy of output from our models. And so that basically means you can't trust it. Is that, sent is that sentence being placed in front of students, in front of you? Do you always have it present in mind when, if you are engaging with a generative AI tool, you are aware you are keeping that in mind when you're using it, um, that, you know, actually anything that is being presented back to me, I would need to check. Christina, that makes me think of the Air Canada example. Yes. Can you, ex uh, can you explain that a bit for those that haven't heard about it just yet, mm. Teresa? The Air Canada example where somebody was looking on um, Air Canada's web, um, on um, yeah their website, and they wanted to check the bereavement policy. They um, got the information from a chatbot, but unfortunately that information was, was wrong, was incorrect. And um, the airline 
initially was declining to reimburse them because it said they could have found the correct information elsewhere on the um, airline's website. But in the end, um, the judge um, see, uh, or agreed with the complainant that how, how would the complainant know um, or why would they suspect that uh, some of the information would be correct and some of the information would be incorrect? Uh, and at the end, the end of the day, they they got some kind of justice. But um, that was very surprising to us then that um, Air Canada initially would disclaim or uh, yeah would disclaim information provided by its AI bots. Mm -hmm. And I think since then it it had shut it down because it does need to mm -hmm. do a bit more work on it. Yeah. Yeah. So it is not that somebody found wrong information on another website. It was on a on a yeah, well, an organization's website where you think you can trust that, where you think when you engage with an agent um, that is employed by the organization that they would provide the factual response and you wouldn't have to double check it in three different other places um, because that also then means, can you trust the other places where the information has been placed? Or is that maybe in the future also updated by AI and nobody is checking it? So it, it to me, it feels like the the factual checking uh, or ideas around it and the concern about facts has, has had already been, of course, talked about from the start, but it is uh, more and more examples are coming up where that actually is being placed more into the into front of mind. However, my question still is how much of that do people really keep in mind when they are looking things up on um, chatbots, when they're engaging with them, do we always double check, triple check that the information that we got is there, especially when it sounds pretty reasonable, when there's not a glaring mistake in there? Um, how will that also affect the work with our students? How will that affect trustworthiness um, in any of the information that is being provided and that is being shown? And so coming back to our conversation about, uh, well, AI use in portfolios then, um, what does it mean for, for a privacy like privacy policy like that? Um, we, we had examples earlier where people said that the organizations that they work for are working on AI guidelines. Um, what I then would expect really in a way is that um, the lawyers who will be involved in those guidelines probably and policies would have read um, these privacy policies and terms and conditions and they will need to read every single update of it um, in order to determine whether a particular tool can be used or not. How are they informing the communities? How does all of that trickle down to an individual instructor, to an individual student? Um, where is that information updated? Um, how can they be kept up to date? And maybe some of those items, um, some of those points that were in the, the policy also be explained to people. Um, what does X actually mean for you if you were to use that in the classroom? Would then there be an allow list um, of AI tools that can be used similarly to other tools that are being supported by portfolio program officers um, who say, yes, you can use any tool, but we only give support for X, Y, Z, that they then are also knowledgeable to a degree in how to interpret some of these policies and what students can expect. We don't yet have all the answers, rather more questions than we had at the start once we get into this topic. And um, that to me also shows that there, there need to be many more conversations and we would definitely like to invite you to, to stay part of those conversations. Let us know what questions you also have that we should be as community should be looking into. We are coming from different countries. And thank you, Kenji, for being here at a very ungodly hour um, in the night from, from Europe. We appreciate you being here and um, being part of the conversation. And so we have at minimum four, four or five different countries uh, represented in today's chat that, that I've recognized. 
potentially more. And everybody has different jurisdictions. Everybody has different requirements in regards to data privacy, data sovereignty as well. Um, if we are in particular thinking about indigenous students, but also um, anybody else, um, not everything that comes out of one country can then one-to-one -one be used in another country uh, without any other implications. And so we'll continue with the ethical considerations. And they, we've already touched on them that there's, of course, data privacy, ownership, authorship, authenticity, if you're looking back at the copyright questions, for example. Um, don't even get me started on diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization and the biases that are included in AI models because, of course, they were often not created by or a diverse group of people were often not involved in that. Um, and also, would that mean if you're using any of these tools that we are outsourcing our thinking and reflecting? Earlier, we've had a brief look at um, Riff at, to as reflectant partner that is asking questions, but there are certainly already students that are using chatbots to write their reflections and submitting an early draft and then prompting the chatbot to submit a better version um, so that it uh, that it can mimic what a student would do. And we also have the training mechanisms. How are especially generative AI tools trained? On what data are they trained? And um, is that something that we want to expose ourselves and our students to? So many, many more questions to be had, which then takes us into our debrief for a couple of minutes there with Ellie. Thanks. So we have certainly covered a lot of really complex ideas. And as Christina mentioned, we have a lot of conversations to continue having. Um, and we've really just barely scratched the surface. So I'd really like to invite everyone to a time of reflection as a debrief. Um, so we'll spend the next uh, maybe five or so. We'll check in after five minutes. Um, answering some of these questions. So we have, what are you thinking, or what are you taking away from today's discussion? Um, what topics would you like us to explore more in depth? And what haven't we considered today? So we'd like to invite you to think and answer this for yourself and um, really encourage you to answer in the chat if you are willing. So I'll give me about five minutes, we'll check in and see how, how we're doing. All right, thank you so much everyone that was um, sharing in the chat. Um, we'll be sure to make note of all of these ideas. Um, we have a lot of conversations to continue. So that then takes us to upcoming events. Megan already shared our next one for the platform providers. But since we are getting towards the end of the session, I'm just putting all the links into the chat that are for the remainder of the slides so that you can easily copy them. But we will also definitely make the, when we make the recording available, we'll send it the link to the slides again so that you also have them right there. So the very next webinar that we have planned is in, um, in a few weeks on the 15th on, or 16th of April, depending on where you live in the world. So 16th of April will be for us in Oceania for sure. Um, and then the, the rest will most likely be for, for Europe and uh, Africa and then also the Americas, where we are talking with platform providers and their perspectives on AI. It is a select group of platform providers. We are definitely also thinking about running a separate event for those that are operating um, in different parts of the world, because of course with Europe, it can be tricky to have an event that works across all time zones. The ABLE annual meeting um, has not yet been announced, um, but make sure to sign up for the newsletter to receive the details once we have that published. I'll, I also put in the link to the ABLE LinkedIn page that you can follow um, if, you are, if you prefer that platform so that there will also be announcements that you can see. The ePortfolio Forum will also happen again this year, most likely in October, as far as I know. And details will be shared in the ePortfolio's Australia newsletter, as well as on its website, for which you'll find links also in the chat. 
We look forward to seeing you there and talking about all things portfolios. And if you would like to propose a topic or want to facilitate a session as part of our AI in Portfolios webinar series or any other topic that you would love to discuss around portfolios, please do make sure to get in touch. Um, you can do that, for example, through me or any other ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force member, and we can then take it to ABLE or ePortfolios Australia in particular. So thank you so much for coming along today, sharing your questions, sharing what you have already done and for discussing the topic with us. We'll make sure to also take relevant links from the chat and put them into the presentation so that you do have them readily available for your review and reflection on the session. And if you have any final comments or questions, as Megan said in the chat, please do feel free to share them with us. Um, you're welcome to do that either in the chat or by grabbing the microphone. <laughs>